Hi, folks. Larry Roller here with my friend from down under, Marshall Dobson. Hi, Marshall. Howdy, Larry. Now, Larry, I know that uh, some of your American viewers uh, from time to time think that we're doing too much Australian content. Well, Larry, the story is that a good story is a good story no matter where it is. I agree. And, and today, let's hope that... Uh, you can regale us with a few of your yarns and perhaps I can do the same. But the important thing is, Larry, for anybody watching today is to hit the like and subscribe buttons. And that way you will be assured of being notified every week about uh, this wonderful podcast of yours, Larry. And there was such great feedback here down under after uh, your interview with Grant Dixon and what a horse he is. Leap to fame. We talked about him. We've talked him up. Uh, some say he's the greatest horse in the world. I know that there's nothing outside of America for Americans, but I tell you what, he'd run some time down there. And uh, at his latest outing, he won the $1 million Garrard's Miracle Mile. And now, that when, was, when was that? You, you sent me that film, right? That's right. It was the Saturday before where we are uh, filming this. So I guess it was March the 9th in Australian terms. That would have been March the 8th in your terms. And that horse, he paced in 48 and change. And that was a $1 million race sponsored by our great friends at uh, Garrard's. And it was held at Menangle, which is a 7 eighths track. And Menangle's just outside of Sydney in New South Wales. And uh, Leap to Fame started almost from the outside hole. He started from Barrier 9. He had to avoid a horse that was galloping early. And uh, he just came around the outside of them, and he was just simply brilliant again. So I, I know just... he, sat, he sat right alongside the lead horse the whole way, just head to head, head the whole mile, and then just drew off. Racing in the Miracle Mile. One of the best away was Hi, my name is Jeff. Speak the truth, showing good speed. But have a look at Jeff come across. He's just going roughly. Oh, he's bobbled out of his gear. Hi, my name is Jeff. So speak the truth is go to scoot through and go to the lead. Spirit of St. Louis gets the trail. They were followed next on the outside by Leap to Fame. Hi, my name is Jeff is down and pacing, but just going very ungainly out of the straight. Sooner the better. Loyalist has lobbed the 1 1. They were followed behind them then, but don't stop dreaming. And Frankie Ferocious is last. First quarter was 26-1. They go to the back end. Speak the Truth was able to hold the lead. Spirit of St. Louis is second. And up on the outside, Leap to Fame punching the breeze. They were followed then by Sooner the Better. Loyalist in the 1-1. Hi, my name is Jeff. Is three back in the moving line. Followed by Don't Stop Dreaming. And last of all is Frankie Ferocious. The best part of 25 metres off the top. They run inside the halfway mark. 28 the second quarter. 54 and 1 the half. And the leader is one of the Queenslanders. Speak the truth. His compatriot is up on the outside, sitting in second spot. Leap to fame. Gets to the leader's wheel. 600 to go. Spirit of St. Louis under lock and key. Next, the outsiders. Loyalist. Sooner the better. Hi, my name is Jeff from Frankie Ferocious and Don't Stop Dreaming's last of all as they come for the money and group one glory in the Miracle Mile and the leader has speak the truth but here comes Leap to Fame. Nowhere to go for Spirit of St. Louis. They were followed further back in the field then by Sooner the better. Getting into the clear at the right time. Leap to Fame goes to the lead. Here's the boulder in the field. Sooner the better. Sidling up alongside. Frankie Ferocious into the clear from Spirit of St. Louis. Leap to Fame needs to fight. He leads again. Leap to Fame. This could be a historic victory. This standard bridge superstar. What a win. Too good. Leap to Fame. And the winner of the race, number nine, Leap to Fame, Grant Dixon. Well, there he is. Coming down the straight. One more time, ladies and gents, the victorious leap to fame. Ten consecutive wins, make that now 11. The Inter Dominion, the Hunter Cup, and now into the record books with victory in Australia's greatest mile. Because that was a, that's an amazing race. That's an amazing horse. It, it, it's an amazing track too, Larry, a 1,400-metre track, the, the newest metropolitan track in Australia. And uh, Grant Dixon, uh, this boy who, well, we call him a boy, Larry, at our age, I guess everyone's a boy, aren't they? But uh, Grant has done such a good job. He's overcome leukaemia. He's overcome a broken marriage. But who hasn't, Larry, I suppose? 
Uh, and he's had so many setbacks in his life. Uh, the death of his father, who was his greatest ally, Bill Dixon, a former Australian trainer of the year in his own right. And this fellow wasn't born with a silver spoon, Grant Dixon. And uh, to watch this horse leap to fame in the black and white checks sitting outside the leader, you saw that he had to avoid interference, severe interference early. Yeah, I see that. When the other horse galloped, uh, his name is Jeff, inside of him. And I guess many drivers would have gone backwards at that start to avoid the galloping horse, Larry, but not Grant. He pressed on with leap to fame and he made his own luck. And uh, I tell you what, that, that horse and that driver and trainer, they're, they're a little the same. Uh, no wonder they get on so famously because um, leap to fame never gets anything easy and Grant has never got anything easy. He races clean and... He's got an impeccable record as a trainer and a driver, and uh, we're so fortunate down here to have a horse like him. And and I guess when we think back, Larry, uh, he was New Zealand bred, but you can remember back in the days of Cardigan Bay, who really led the Australian uh, and New Zealand onslaught over there. And there were so many horses uh, from down under which proved their, themselves uh, on the world stage via uh, the Yonkers International. I know Apmat went over there in the 90, early 1960s. Rabans was another one to go there than Cardigan Bay. But it seems to be now that uh, the Australian trainers and drivers, drivers particularly, are really making a mark. Those boys, those McCarthy brothers, uh, Andrew and Toddy, are doing a great job. As far as trainers are concerned, Peter Tritton and his son Shane and Shane's wife, Lauren, who, who drives. Very rare to see a woman driving uh, in the States and driving winners, Larry. But I guess you can go back to the days of B. Farber. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember B. Farber well. And I raced with her at, at, at a few different racetracks, uh, and we had dinner one night and, uh, at Pompano Park. She raced I, one or two years at Pompano Park, and... Uh, um she was um she was gifted she was good she was she was gifted and um win a lot of races win a lot of titles so uh there's another one here uh jackie uh ingracia really really good really good trainer really good driver and uh there's one or two other ones but th them two stand out to me, I, I I think uh as far as harness racing goes, uh Jackie it's and Gracia is my I like Jackie and Gracia more than I like B Farber. It's uh it's I have for reasons for that. You uh, well I, I you uh, you uh you do have your reasons, Larry, and we'll leave we'll just leave them. No, it's their legitimate <laughs> reasons. I, I I I I I don't want to get into it and and I and and B. Farber's not here any longer, but uh, I can tell you that all of Jackie's accomplishments were done with hard work and hay and oats. That's as much I, as I say. I heard once, Larry, that, that you accompanied a female driver to Florida. You went to Tampa with her. Who are you talking about? Uh, uh... <laughs> no, no, nobody. <laughs> Now, Larry, it's been very hard for women to break through what you'd call the glass ceiling in the States as far as driving is concerned. And this girl, Lauren Tritton, uh, formerly Lauren Pinella, is doing it there with her husband, Shane Tritton. But in Australia, it's a different kettle of fish. The women drivers more than hold their own against the, uh, the male drivers. And we have champion women drivers here like Karen Manning and, and Karen Gath, Grant Dixon's wife, Trista, highly accomplished driver, a number of them in every state. And I wonder why it is that they haven't been able to break through over there so much. I don't know. I I, I don't know. But the few that are around, um, I don't know. I, maybe it's uh, maybe it's because they were never really <clears throat> given a chance. Um, I know that in Monticello, there were four or five of them. And... Um, you know the 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 trainers that didn't drive themselves um, always wanted uh, one of the leading guys, and and none of these girls, including Jacqueline and Gracia, who's a great driver, never got no catch drives, never got nothing. And, and then when when the uh, 
it, probably in the very early 70s and well even before then uh in in this in, in the early 80s and in late 70s when uh catch drivers when train the, the top drivers uh stopped training and uh I guess Lucian Fontaine and maybe Bobby Frame was was one of the first ones that just uh, hooked up with a trainer that had 30, 40 horses, much like Carmen Abatello and his brother Anthony. And they became just catch drivers. And I, and it really started to happen um, a lot in the in the middle in the middle 80s. Uh, maybe early 80s, uh, everybody switched over. Campbell, O'Donnell, all of the guys that had a big stable that were top drivers, it was just too much for them to run a 20, 30, 40-horse stable and catch drive every race every night. So they all switched over. So the girls from the very beginning never had a chance o- over here. Uh, and one of the reasons is because they didn't, n- nobody, n- not one, the, the girls that had, and they were, they were probably one out of 10 trainers w- w- were girls, and none of them had a, a big enough stable to, uh, to, 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 to make any kind of mark. And, um, and, and the ones, and, and some of them just never wanted to drive themselves. So um, it's one of them things that I, I guess if they was, there's a lot of girls that are out there training and everything that I'm sure are qualified, but I think it's because they were never given a, ch- a legitimate chance, I think. I don't know. We look, we, look at, um, we look at women trainers, and I mean, it was only a week and a half ago, um, in your terms, a week and a half ago in our terms, that it was International Women's Day. And you've done your share for international women over the years, Larry, no doubt. But International Women's Day, we have trainers there like Linda Toscano and uh, and Casey Coleman, who never never use women drivers. And I guess uh, having had a lot to do with thoroughbreds back in the day, Larry, you would rarely see uh, you would rarely see women jockeys here in Australia, in Victoria, which is the home of the Melbourne Cup, our biggest race of the year. Uh, there's a, a girl down there, Jamie Carr, who is just brilliant and regularly wins two, maybe three winners each metropolitan meeting. Uh, but back in the day, I guess the most famous, uh, would she have been the most famous woman jockey over there? Uh, Robin Smith, I think she married Fred Astaire. Well, Julie Crone, too, was right after her. Yeah, they, yeah she was good. Julie Crone was was excellent. I, I'm not too familiar with, with Robin, but... I. I know I know a lot about Julie. Um, she was <clears throat> she was something. She was good, uh, but th- I think that might be that might be a little different. Um, maybe because I, I I don't I really don't know the reason. I I just think that uh, you mentioned something before that the the Toscano or some of the girl trainers here. Why don't they <laughs> why why don't they use girl drivers? You know why don't they drive themselves? It's probably a question you have to ask them. I I never thought about it because n- most of the time I drove my own horses, uh, and uh, uh, so I th- that that thought never a- entered my mind. But uh, but it stands to reason, Larry, because uh, horses uh, we've found I think over the years here they used to have a ten stone limit. You had to have uh, lead in, in the in your driver's kit and uh, if you didn't weigh 10 stone, we had a 10 stone limit, then that went out the way. But it seems to be all the great drivers are smaller people. Well, traditionally, you've got women who are smaller and Larry, fancy me having to tell you about how it is that animals respond to a woman's touch, Larry, that horses would just, would just uh, we've seen many times male drivers get beaten on horses and then a woman will drive them. And they'll go better. So I think that there's a, a lot to be said for the girls. And I was talking a minute ago about uh, Fred Astaire. He married Robin Smith. And in doing so, Fred Astaire became the first Hollywood superstar ever to ride a feature race winner. Okay, here you go again. All right. Um... Now, Larry, I've been reading your book. It's great reading. It's fabulous reading. I saw a movie the other night that was so good. You know how sometimes they adapt books and make movies from them and we all the time you're talking about your movie and your TV series, which hopefully is going to happen, Larry, but 
There are a lot of books which have been turned into movies, haven't there? I saw one the other night, a great movie, and I went out and bought the book the next day. It was called The Bible. And uh, we're talking about your book now, Against All Odds. And I was reading it the other day, and there was a fascinating uh, page there. Uh, well, there was more than one page about him, but this one page about a story which really took me, and that was the story of a, a great character from days gone by. Uh, he was a hell of a guy. He was a funny guy, and, uh, and you knew him well. Uh, Jerry Silverman, I'm referring to. Jerry died only this year. He was a Hall of Famer. And uh, the you've got to tell us the, for those who haven't got the book, please, Larry, tell us the story about Booby. Tell us the Habib story. Jerry, <clears throat> Jerry, was a, Jerry was one of a kind. He was a, and a real good guy and a good friend and would do, and, and a great trainer and would do anything for, for anybody and uh, probably had one of the first uh, in the New York area, New York trainer, uh, Romeo Hanover. Um, he, uh, back in the 60s, he, um, <laughs> now the story I'm going to tell, I, 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 before I put it in the book, because the, the, the guy who was going to uh, publish this book for me who was helping me said, uh, you got to put some funny stuff in here. And quite honestly, there was nothing in my life that was funny. So I didn't know what to say, but there were one or two stories that, that were, that were, that I, I, I could put in. So one of them was the story you're talking about. And I called up Jerry. I says, Jerry, I says, remember that story about Habib, uh, that when we were together in the early seventies, he says, yeah, I says, I'm writing a book. They want me to put something funny in a book. I, I don't ha have any funny stories. So I says, uh, would you care very much if uh, I, he says, put it in. What do I care? I says, well, you, you're nominated. You're going into the Hall of Fame in another two months. And he says, uh, why do I care? He says, just use the story. Don't worry about it. So uh, I'm going to tell you the story. and But I want to tell you that... Um, he more than made up uh he he more than made up for what he did for this particular owner um later on here's the story me and jerry in the early 70s we were we were betting everybody knows my story i lost millions of dollars betting on sports and jerry was close behind me and uh Jerry was a re recognized as a, a, a super trainer back back then, and he, uh, I guess, he had more morals in one way than than I did. I I did whatever I had to do to to get the money in order to save my life and and my family that that were being threatened because of my actions. Jerry had basically the same problem, so he says. Um, he said, um, "I gotta, I gotta have a hundred thousand. If I don't have it by next week, I, I almost got killed. I don't know what to do." And and I says, "Jerry, look, I'm gonna make a couple of big bets this weekend. If I win, I'll give you the money." But naturally, I didn't win. So uh, we were staying at the Tradewinds Motel, and uh, in Yonkers, and. He said to me, he says, uh, Larry, I don't know what to do. And and I says, look, you have this good owner, this wealthy guy, Habib, uh, Arab guy or whatever he was. I says, tell him back in them days in the 70s, I, I think Cardigan Bay, when Stanley Dancer went over there and Eddie Cobb in the 60s, they come back with some of these Australian, New Zealand horses and uh, and that was the new fad now. Go 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 over there and buy horses. So tell Habib that you found one or two horses in Australia. That the agent down there called you, and you want to get them. And you have to send the money down right away. And tell him uh, the horses cost a hundred, a hundred twenty thousand, and uh, he'll give you the cash. And that's exactly what he did. So um, he got the money. He straightened out his his gambling debt, 
And uh, about maybe two, three weeks later, Habib says to him, he says, Jerry, when are these horses going to come? He says, oh, he says, uh, uh, one of them got sick, so uh, they, they're not going to they wait. They're going to ship both of them together. They're in quarantine. And every week it was another story. Well, finally, after two months, uh, Jerry says, uh, he when Habib asked him, he says, um, Oh, good news. I forgot to tell you, they're on their way. Okay. All right. And about a week later, uh, Jerry, the guy, Habib kept asking, and, and Jerry says, uh, he put that Jerry Silverman, his arm around your shoulder, and, he's, and he put his head, his mouth next to his ear. He says, Habib, I got terrible news. I'm heartbroken. The ship sank. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and that was the story. And instead oh, of Beep getting crazy, he consoled Jerry and uh, <laughs> bought another couple of horses. So anyway, but he, Jerry made it up to him in many, many different ways. But he got himself, uh, look, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. You have to do, the, the, you know, when, when there's, there's, there's money involved, everybody knows this. The line of morality moves, it keeps moving until that 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 straightened out and the people jerry and i were dealing with um they didn't want to hear excuses they was they they were they were tough and and they were there were many times when uh um uh, in fact it was kind of lucky that we both owed as much money as we did because if it was just a matter of five or ten thousand they just kill you and leave you in the street and let everybody know that this is what happens when you don't pay. But because it was considerable, because we were uh, betting and uh, pay or collect every Tuesday, you can go a whole week. And they just, because we always paid, they never shut you out. So um, that's that's the Jerry Silverman story. He was a he was a great great guy, and we spent. What's a lot the, of the old the old story, Larry? Is uh, you're in trouble if you owe the bank a million dollars. But if you arm a hundred million, then the bank's in trouble. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and I and want, and a hundred million could save your life. So I mean, yeah. if it looks like you're going to have trouble, the more you ask them for, if you have that kind of credit or reputation, the better chance you have of not getting a beaten or surviving, and the better chance you have of making a deal. Uh, because in my case, it was uh, almost eight hundred thousand dollars, and. Uh, and, and and all around me, guys were getting killed and running away for, for and getting bad beatings for five thousand, six, eight thousand. You know, so I want to ask you. A, I want to ask you a story, Larry, and, uh, to tell us a story about uh, Frank Sinatra. You mentioned in your book, Against All Odds, uh, numerous times that that you went there. But I want to tell you a story first, and this concerns my first friend in harness racing. This is fifty years ago. And uh, it happened, it happened maybe 40 years ago at a, a country track in New South Wales, and it was called Richmond. Now, Richmond was one of a kind. In the day, they never had any 1,400 metre or seven furlong tracks, but this was a seven furlong track. But it was right-handed. It wasn't left-handed, and they raced on the grass. So it was a right-handed grass track. And to get from the grandstand over to the back of the track, it was a long trip, pretty big track. And, of course, in Australia, we've had on-track bookmakers, Larry, where they set a price and you can take that price. It isn't a matter of what the uh, what the pari mutual returns. They'll put up, for example, they might put up two to one about a horse. So if you have 100 on, you get back 300. And then if there's no interest in that horse, they'll push it out to five to two, which is, which is two and a half to one, which is 350 back for your 200. And, and therefore, it's a little like the stock exchange, the bookmakers ring. And back in the day at the Metropolitan Tracks, Harold Park and the Melbourne Showgrounds, they'd have 150 or 200 bookmakers. So you can imagine uh, with crowds of 40,000 people what it was like. It was a throng of activity and it was every 25 or 30 minutes there was more action. Anyway, this was a country track in New South Wales called Richmond and, and Clary Sweeney trained very close to the Richmond track. It was handy for him because he could take his horses down there and give them a practice run and see exactly how they'd handle the right-handed way of going or how they'd handle the, the grass track. And he had a horse in one day called Learned Friend. They had daytime meetings. 
And this horse, with the bookmakers, he was either going to be odds on, which means you put on 100 to get back 180, or he was going to be even money or better. Maybe if he was six to four, which is one and a half to one, you'd get back 250. And, and, and whether or not the horse, well, Clary's no longer with us, so I can tell the story, whether or not the horse would try was all dependent on the price. If he was going to be 100 on to win 50, he wouldn't try. If he was going to be 100 on to win 200, he would try. And the stables were a fair way away and the horses would come out onto the track and several people were in the grandstand and there was a guy there called Johnny Conroy and Johnny liked a drink. So it was worked out with the trainer and the driver, Clary Sweeney, that if the horse was going to try Learned Friend, he would give a sign to those who were in the grandstand and then they would, like pigeons, they'd be released and they'd go and start betting with the bookmakers. There was 12, maybe 15 bookmakers there in those days. And you could probably get on with those 12 or 15 bookmakers at the price they are offering. You could probably get on to win 15 or 20,000 with one, and then you might have to take a shorter price, and so it goes. And you always could bet with the Parry Mutual as well because there were no fixed odds on the Parry Mutual boards. Anyway, Johnny Conroy was given the job of going down to see Clary and finding out exactly what was happening with the horse. Johnny arrived back, and he was puffing and out of breath, and uh, they said, what's happening, Curly? And he'd had a drink or two this day. And he said, Clary said when he comes out on the track and parades uh, past all the, the grandstand, he will have his whip under his right arm if he's going to try. So if the whip is under the right arm, he's going to try. Or is it that he say he's going to put the whip under the left arm if, if, if he's going to try? Well, look, he's only got two arms. It had to be one of the two. So in his confusion, in his drunken confusion, he's got it mixed up. So the horses have come out in the track and Clary's had the, the whip under the right arm. But, of course, nobody knows whether to bet or not to bet because they don't know whether the horse is trying or not going to try. So there was only one thing to do, and that was dispatch the red coat, the clerk of the course, who was grabbed. He was standing in the in the uh, as the horses paraded and someone went down and grabbed this clerk of the course, who's still alive, so I won't mention him, and said, here, do us a favour, race round at the start, which was a long trip around there, and ask Clary if this horse is trying or not. The next minute or two, five minutes later, the clerk of the course came back breathless. His horse was gasping for breath and looking for water, and he's driving up, he's riding up the home straight, and his head's nearly falling off as he keeps nodding. So everyone went down and bet. The horse jumped straight to the front, got the money, and it all worked out well. But it just goes to show, Larry, there's... Many a slip between the cup and the lip. Yeah, yeah that, that's for sure. Now, your Frank Sinatra stories. Well, they're not really stories, but uh, I could tell you um, he, ever since I was a kid, uh, uh, I, I, I just loved that kind of, I, I loved that kind of, the music that he sang, uh, the songs that he sang, I loved. I thought he had uh, I, the, the way he his phrasing and everything else and the arrangements is just even from a young kid, 15, 16. I didn't even listen to rock and roll. I listened to Sinatra. Well, there was a kid. I, I'm almost positive his name is Billy Perigene. He lives in California now. He used to come. He used to race at Monticello. Good kid. And I was very friendly with him. And uh, his cousin was a comedian called Pat Henry. Pat Henry was the opening act for Sinatra for a long time, maybe 15, 20 years, up until his death. Uh, and he used to come up to the Concord to do his show every year, and he'd be up there for a week or two weeks. And uh, he'd come to the track, and and, and we, we got pretty close. So he knew of uh, how I felt about Sinatra and a uh, very interesting guy aside from um, the music. Um, and uh, he called me up when he went back to California, he called me up. He says, listen, he says, uh, come down here. Sinatra's having a, a, a party. I guess it was in between marriages, I guess. It was in the 70s. Um, maybe late 70s, I think. I'm not sure. Um, he says, come come on down. Sinatra's having a party in his Palm Springs house. It's going to be a three, four-day affair. Everybody's going to be here. 
and um and i i was dying to go but i had i had um i had three horses in the day i was supposed to be there and they all could win and uh, i had one or two in the following day that i could win and i and um i had to make up my mind um and i didn't go and i win all the, all the races that i had the, for the horses that i had in but um i wish i would have went i i i always wanted to meet him uh he did and and through pat henry i found out that the wonderful things he did to help fellow actors and people that were in trouble uh that couldn't pay the hospital bills and they were they were dozens of them that he paid the whole bill and most of the time nobody even know, knew where it came from he was just a good guy he'd have a couple of drinks he'd get a little shitty sometimes but uh he he was a good guy and so that that's that that's one of the regrets i have uh, in my, in my whole life um not going to palm springs and spending them 3 days and that that's that's the my frank sinatra story whenever he was in town whenever he was there i saw him in vegas i saw him in in manhattan i saw him i saw him wherever he played if i can get there i got there he was just in my opinion he was the greatest uh for for the american songbook music over the years larry you must have met a lot of famous uh, actors and and singers and comedians uh, simply through the life you led yeah I, I i did especially when i went to uh when i went to california i ra i raced uh i raced for a while in california and uh i got very friendly with um the first one i got very friendly was with milton burl well the people that are listening to this now probably don't even know who milton burl is but through milton burl who was the president of friars club out there i met i met a lot of a lot of famous people and um some of the beautiful most beautiful actresses that are out there and just about every one of them uh, went to the racetrack uh, you know almost every every afternoon uh, fred Astaire was one of them he had a, he had a, he had a bunch of horses fred fred did but yeah i i i did but uh that they um you know that that they never i wasn't I, that kind of stuff don't impress me. What impressed me was Sinatra, the singing, the arrangement, the perfection, the 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 every everything that he did, the phrasing. Uh, it was unlike any other, and that 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 impressed me. Being a Hollywood star and you know playing make believe that, you know, and most of them are phony anyway. You know, I, everything is I love you, I love you, great, I love you, and I don't you know I don't go for that stuff anyway. You've never been a fan of California, have you? For that reason, yeah, I, I lived there for three years. I had to get I had to get out of there. I I I just I could, the the last the last straw was uh, well, there were two last straws. There was a, a a friend of a friend of mine that used to have cards made up, a uh, producer, and uh, every time you see a nice looking girl at a nightclub or saw me go over to them hand them a card and he said listen uh i'm looking for somebody that has everything that you have uh give me a call and it's and there's something i'm working on now you you might fit right in and that's how you know just a just a sleaze ball just you know and 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 then but the one night i was in a place called spago so it was a restaurant out there and i was sitting with a couple of friends of mine and one or two of the actors and all of a sudden this uh, another actor comes in and the guy i'm sitting next to who is an actor and says oh here's that piece of shit that, 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 that i hope you don't come over here but sure enough he comes over there to say hello and uh the guy who, who called him a piece of shit you know jumped up and they hug and they kiss and all and then when the guy leaves yeah i'll get i'll give you call tomorrow we'll do this again and everything and uh, and then when the guy walks away, he says, I hate that mother. I hate him. I can't. Yeah, just phony, phony, phony stuff. And not all of them, but enough of them where um, you can't get away from it. So I, after three years, I, 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 I had to leave. They, you know, when you're born in the street and spend most of your life in the street or at the racetrack, just, just different kind of people, you know. Um, 
it's it's like the racetrack uh, opera you know it's it's just different i'm used to racetrack people horses dogs and music not that all that other phony stuff from what you say larry it seems that he could feign sincerity with the best of them so frank no, no, the guy who you're talking about who was gushing over the other guy who didn't... Oh, play. yeah, 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 yeah. I, it, it just... You know why? Because in life, you, you don't even... Know, when you see that all around you, you don't know who to trust. You don't know who to believe. You don't know what to believe. It's it's terrible. It's just just terrible. I'm going through a little bit of that in the last four or five years with the because of my the movie and the scripts and everything else and and you're dealing with these people that are just you know they just I, I, oh I love it I love it I love it I love it this is just what we're looking for and then they just never return your phone calls and uh it's just nobody you know and that's why I, I start off every meeting that I have and say look I, I'm a these those and dumbs guys you know I, I'm from the street. And and all I'm going to ask you at this meeting, and this is what I said when I dealt with Sony Pictures and Village Roadshow. I says, look, please don't say anything at this table that you can't do. A no is as good as a yes, and and um, and and I'll and I'll I'll do the same thing. And um, sometimes it works, sometimes it don't work. Um, so anyway, that's why I had that's why I had to leave California. I'm just used to street people. Very important. If you like this podcast and you want to keep watching, all you have to do is press like, subscribe, and ring the bell, and those notifications will be made to you. We're a little bit, uh, I don't know, we're not a lot of mob talk, not a lot of mob talk today, Larry, but I, I want to ask you a question uh, just before we, we wrap up. But I want to tell you a story about, we we're talking about drivers before. I want to tell you a story about one of the all time greats of greatdom. Uh, this man was bred in the sulky. He's 79 years old now, and he's still driving winners and still driving city winners. I think he's half man, half horse. His name is Brian Gath, and uh, Brian has driven, I don't know, maybe upwards of 8,000 winners in an illustrious career. His father was a champion driver before him. His brother Neville was a great driver, Neville's son Andrew, and his wife Kate are taking all before them now. And I just want to tell you of a steward's inquiry which happened here about 25 years ago. Now, a steward's inquiry would be known over there as a judge's inquiry, Larry, and the way it works, that if the driver of a horse believes that he's been impeded, that driver has the opportunity to lodge a protest. He can lodge an objection against his finishing position compared to another horse. Anyway, this was a grade one race, a $100,000 race, and Brian Gath drove the horse who was first past the post. Now, because it was such a big race, I guess the guy who drove the second horse was grasping at straws, and it was bordering on a frivolous protest. It was almost a frivolous objection that there were no grounds at all, but the guy thought, well, I'll try and hit it out of the ballpark and see how I go here and see if I can talk my way into the, into the first prize money. So he waffled on. The stewards, the judges opened an inquiry, and this guy waffled on for 10 minutes or so that he ran me off the track, he ran me up the track, he put his gig wheels in front of my horse, he had his whip outside of the confines of the sulky, he was leaning too far back, he took my running and everything in the world that he did, uh, he came out with. And, of course, all of it was fiction. So the stewards managed to listen to this for 10 minutes or so and then they said, well, it's time for your evidence, Mr Gath. What do you have to say? And Brian looked at the chief judge and he said, do any of your gen you gentlemen have a comb, please? And the chief judge looked at him and he said, what do you want a comb for? He said, because I've got a trophy to collect. That's how certain he was, Larry, and he collected that, he collected that trophy. Now, Larry. We may be being a little sentimental today, but I'm going to ask you anyway, out of all the people you've met and all the things you've done and all the roads you've travelled, for you, what has been the nicest thing about being Larry Roller? Probably um, the handful of friends and my family that supported me through 
seven of the worst years anybody could ever have. And without them, um, I never would have survived. Um, so that that's it. I just, I, I, I have, I, in, in, I think I said this once before, somebody asked me about if I have any, any regrets. And the only regrets I have was uh, being a bad, bad kid when I was a kid and putting my mother through everything that she went through and my father and uh, being so ashamed after the fact that I completely abused the only people that would let me abuse them, and that was my family. And um, and even though they were paid back, um, they were just regular people working hard and yet gave me their life savings uh, and, did, and did a whole lot more. Um, that's it. As far as the people, the other people that I met uh, outside of my family, um, what says it all to me is that the time when I had the Christmas party at the Concord Hotel in uh, 1981, and I invited 3,000 people, and Bobby Parker, who owned the hotel, says, I, I, I don't have enough room for 3,000 people. You got to cut it down to 1,100. And uh, me thinking at the time, because I was successful for the prior for three years prior to that, in 81, I had a real good year. That's why I had the party. And uh, I had a tough time cutting the, 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 li the guest list down for the Christmas party, thinking I had 3,000 friends. And um, and then uh, I, I went from uh, from that situation to um, living in a mansion to living on on a park bench, and um, it was at that time when I found out that maybe out of three thousand calls that I made, one responded and come and got me and told me that uh, a life lesson that. If in life you had a party for all your true friends, all you would need is this table we're sitting on, and it was a table for four. And and um, and I believe that's true. And the sad part is, until you hit these lows, if you live a relatively normal life. You really never know who your true friends are. You never know it until you're up against it. You never who, know who who got your back. You just don't. It's when it's when you get when you hit rock bottom, and and people come to you uh, without even asking. Um, th then you find out. And I feel bad for all these people that just go through life thinking they have so many good friends. Um, and they're, they're just never tested. And, uh, and that's, in my opinion, that's, that's not the case. So I forgot already what your question was, but, um, somewhere in there is an answer. I'm sorry. I asked Larry in times of, of adversity, uh, it isn't so much that you know who your friends are, but it's that you know who your friends are not. And you would know that because it was a case in your life of plume peacock one day feather dust to the next, you went from the penthouse to the shit house, And it's sad that people uh, let you do that. I can just tell you that we need to hit the like, subscribe and uh, ring the bell so you can get notified of this podcast next week. As the dog said, as he put his tail in his mouth, Larry, this looks like the end for this time, but I have to tell you about your adversity that there are three things I want to tell you. The first one is to do is to be. The second one is to be is to do. And as your hero, Frank Sinatra, once said, do be, do be, do. <laughs> Till next time, Lawrence. <laughs> I'll see you next time, uh, Marshall. Looking I'm forward to that. Larry. I'm going to put that race on this podcast. I'll have Tom edit it in. Uh, because it's uh, I want these 
the my friends here on the American side to see that unbelievable horse. So I'm going to put that ra- race up. So until next time, um, I'll see you around. I'll see you around like a rissole or like a donut. Bye.